Before we get into today's video, first a quick correction and then a housekeeping note. First the correction. In the last video I said that the tank train was symbol 547. It was actually 541 as pointed out by a Chicagoland rail fan. Both are ethanol empty trains, but 541 originates from the NS and 547 originates from CSX. I actually originally thought it was 541 and wrote the video that way, and if you notice the audio in my voiceover is slightly different in the video that went up. That's because after I recorded my voiceover, I second-guessed the 541 and changed it to 547. Here's the original audio. I assumed that it was 149, but as I looked closer, I saw I was wrong. A 541 has come off the UP and heads north on the CNM timetable west, and the quote-unquote corrected audio. A 547 has come off the UP and heads north on the CNM timetable west. Sorry about that. Second, it came to my attention that there's another YouTube channel with the name Northeastern Illinois Rail Fan that actively uploads on here. So from here on, I'll add my name in videos just to differentiate the two. Nothing else will change really, but I am also retiring the original channel intro. With that, here's the new intro in today's video. One of my favorite things to do with this channel is inform. When I first became a rail fan, I had plenty of questions, as I'm sure you did too, but until the internet really took off, there wasn't a very good user-friendly source. So in this new series I'm going to call Back to Basics, we're going to take a look at something that isn't the most exciting thing in the world, but is definitely important to know, track authority. Have you ever looked at a train and wondered who said it was okay for that train to be there? Okay. Probably not, but the fact is that someone had to. There are several forms of track authority in use today, although many can be traced back to timetable operation. More accurately, timetable and train order. In this method, the railroad prints a timetable with a schedule on it. That timetable gives that train authority to operate on that track at that time. Which, if the train runs on time, is good enough. The problem got to be if delays happened, because modifying the timetable required issuing train orders which trains would pick up from certain points along the journey. Two-way radio didn't really become practical until after World War II, so intermediate stations with phones, like towers, were basically the only way to communicate with trains and do this. Today there are essentially two types of authority. Point-to-point -point authority, which isn't an official term at all, but is my blanket term for a few methods that are very similar, but slightly different, and centralized traffic control. We should also define the two sets of unified rulebooks. Many western railroads use a version of the g core the General Code of Operating Rules. Many eastern railroads use NORAC, the Northeast Operating Rules Advisory Committee. Canadian railroads have their own sets of rules for operating in Canada, although CP is a member of G-Corps in the U.S. CN has a separate rulebook for U.S. operation, but these are very hard to find, and I'm not really sure which set they're based on. Let's start with the simplest form of authority, what I call point-to-point -point authority. Most commonly, this is the lowly track warrant, although I believe that's a G-Corps term. In track warrant territory, the dispatcher gives a train specific permission from point A to point B. Permission is recorded by the crew using a standard warrant form, and the dispatcher will tell the crew which boxes to check and how to fill in the lines. The most common warrant is just using checkbox 2, proceed from A to B instruction. Here's a CP-253 picking up a simple track warrant on the CP Chicago sub. Maybe driver to us, King Greek Grove, over. Dispatcher, this is 253. Uh, we're looking to get a warrant, please. Where you at, over? Mile post 33. Ready to copy. Track warrant 2520-2520, March 28, 28-2023-2023 to CP Canadian 8869. 8869 West WC, mile post 33, MP33. Checkbox 2 TWO, proceed from Randall Road to double track switch Penguin Grove on westward WESC, WARD track. Track warrant 2521, check 2 MJR, over. Warrants can be given basically between any two points, a milepost, a station, a switch, pretty much anything listed on the timetable. 
Track warrant territory can have an overlaid signal system, but doesn't have to. If no signals are present, it's usually referred to as dark territory. The big brother to track warrant control is direct traffic control. It does essentially the same thing as the track warrant, but instead of trains being cleared from point A to B, they are cleared through predefined blocks, which are different from signal blocks. Because the blocks are predefined, it is less flexible than the track warrant, and much former DTC territory has been converted over to TWC. You may also hear the term Form D control, typically listed in a timetable as DCS. This was NORAC's attempt to take a track warrant form and combine it with multiple other forms to create a single form for many different uses. For example, the G Corps rulebook utilizes different forms for track bulletins. Form A is commonly for speed restrictions, Form B for work zones, and Form C is a catch-all for pretty much anything else. Railroads can also add their own forms beyond those three if they need to. The NORAC Form D combines all of these into just a single form. CSX morphed this into their form EC1, but it's essentially the same thing. Danny Harmon did an excellent video on the EC1, so for more information on those, I suggest you check that out. As I mentioned, track warrant territory can have signals, but doesn't necessarily. If signals are present, a clear aspect on an automatic, non-controlled signal is never authority for a train to operate. Keep this in mind. Track warrants are the cheapest and simplest way to operate, and on the other end of the spectrum, we have centralized traffic control. In CTC territory, track authority is typically given via signal indication on a controlled signal. Controlled signals are located at control points and are identified by their name, like these at Franklin Park West. Intermediate signals are basically the same as ABS signals, and like ABS signals, are identified by their number plate, like these at Schomburg or these at Roselle. You typically won't hear specific instructions read over the radio in CTC territory, and the phrase signal indication is generally all the authority any train needs. There are exceptions to this, such as permission to open a manually aligned switch and leaving things on a main track, but we won't get into that. Now, there's another quirk to ABS territory. Let's take the double track section of the CP Chicago sub from Randall Road in Elgin to Pingree Grove. This is track warrant territory, but has automatic block signals. In double track territory, one track is signaled in one direction, the other track is signaled in the other direction. This is called authority with the current of traffic, typically right-handed, but it depends on the railroad. They'll usually be referred as the direction of travel they're for. In our example, the northern track is the westward track, the southern track is eastward. Authority to occupy these tracks can either be given by track warrant or track permit, like here, or one other way. We're now on the UP Milwaukee sub. By the rulebook, this is double track signaled for left-hand operation. Shout out to the Chicago and Northwestern. But wait, why do both tracks have signals, and why do these not have number plates, but one says begin ABS? That's because ABS territory can still have controlled signals. This is control point norma. Notice the left-hand track here has a full signal head, while the right-hand track can only display a solid red stop or a flashing red restricting. Operation against the current of traffic requires a track permit from the dispatcher, which is why the right-hand signal can only display a restricting. Contrast this with the CP Chicago sub, which does not have controlled signals governing entry to the subdivision, and thus requires a track warrant. There's one final quirky system that, to my knowledge, is exclusive to Union Pacific. To see it, we need to head to the UP Harvard sub. It's hard to see from here, but the line is three tracks with ABS. By the timetable, this line runs north-south, even though it runs almost directly northwest from Chicago. The outer tracks act as a normal double track line signal for left hand operation. The southern track, track 1, is signaled northward. The northern track, track 3, is signaled southward. Which, yeah, I know is confusing. But what about the middle track? It's actually signaled bi directionally and uses UP rule 9.14.2, the controlled block system. Same with ABS, authority is given either via verbal authority and a track permit or a signal indication on a controlled signal. The middle track, however, unlike the outer tracks, has no normal current of traffic and can be routed either direction depending on the need. When a train is lined onto the middle track, the dispatcher then establishes the current of traffic. 
What I believe happens then is the same as what happens in an absolute permissive block system. All signals in the opposite direction of the current of traffic fall to restricting in order to protect against movements in the other direction. I can't actually confirm this though and there's very little public documentation on the control block system. There are a few other types of authority but none really widely used on main lines. Interlocking limits are areas where authority can be given via control signal, typically from a switch tower. As CTC territory expanded, manual interlockings have become nearly extinct, although Tower A2 in Chicago is a good example of one that still operates. Yard limits are also quite common. Basically, yard limits state that any train can operate at no more than 20 miles per hour within the limits without dispatcher permission, because a locomotive would otherwise need permission every time it went forwards and backwards putting a train together. It gets more complicated than that, like restrictions about moving against current of traffic if applicable, but you get the idea. And there you have it. Knowing which type of traffic control your favorite line uses will make it much easier to know what's going on with a radio, and could potentially save you hours of sitting there looking at... If you have any ideas for subjects you'd like to see covered in this series, let me know. I don't know how often I'll do these, probably just every so often or when I need to fill a hole in the schedule. Feel free to comment, hit the like button, and subscribe, and you can follow me on Instagram and read the blog. Links are in the video description. Until next time, I'm Tyler, and thank you for watching the Northeastern Illinois Railfan YouTube channel.